Hello, everybody. Uh, so our next talk is uh, Mark Shuttleworth from Canonical and Ubuntu. He's going to be talking about the design and implementation of the Unity uh, netbook uh, user experience. So uh, I don't think he needs much more introduction. Mark Shuttleworth. Thank you. It's, like, it's, it's a little early to be getting this message over here. Uh, anyway, it's very nice to be here and uh, great to be back at DevConf. Lots of familiar faces, lots of old friends. Um, is anybody here actually running Unity at the moment? Any, uh, Evan, a couple of other folks? All right. Um, so Unity is a culmination of, of several years' work, um, uh, inspired initially by this sort of explosion in interest in Linux on netbooks. Um, uh, we were approached by a couple of companies from out in, 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 in Taiwan who want to ship Linux on netbooks, but they, they wanted uh, simplified user interfaces, essentially. And so that kicked off a, a process which has culminated now in, uh, in, in Unity. Uh, within Canonical, my job description has changed. I'm no longer the CEO. Uh, that's gone to a much more capable woman than I am. And uh, 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 in return, I get to focus on just the pieces that I'm really interested in. Um, and uh, the, the design of Unity is one of those pieces. So we have a, 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 a design team based in London um, who are responsible for all of the visual and user interaction design that we're doing at Canonical. Um, and, uh, and, and so they're essentially driving this process. Um, but it is an open design process. There is a, a, a mailing list called Ayatana, and uh, we have quite a lot of traffic on that. And we use that as a, as a forum for debating uh, many of the changes that get made and also the, um, uh, um, just the broader theme of design uh, in Ubuntu and in free software generally. So I'll start off with just going back through, through where Unity came from. This is the first version of um, UNR. Um, and there are a couple of things that sort of stand out about it. First, it's very much a full screen kind of experience. Um, a lot of the inspiration for this work came from, um, from the PlayStation, essentially, from game consoles. And the idea of thinking of the, the computer more as a, as a device that you, that you use than as a general purpose computer where you're sort of manipulating lots of different um, pieces of information. So much bigger icons. Uh, because another sort of piece of inspiration was coming from the idea that this is this is all ultimately got to end up being touchable. Touch is very much a, a sort of a primary um, interface technique. Um, we preserved quite a lot of the um, uh, quite a lot of the semantics um, of the GNOME desktop uh, initially. You can see, for example, the categories um, that come from the applications menu in a in a, in a typical GNOME desktop today, um, uh, and you can also see places, those are mapped um, straight from GNOME, essentially, just from the underlying um, uh, uh, infrastructure. So we try to reuse as much of that as possible, um, but focus on presenting people with just the pieces that they're likely to be interested in and uh, just uh, in, in a way that's sort of simpler for the average user to um, navigate. And the feedback on this one was pretty good. I think Toshiba shipped it, um, Dell shipped it, a couple of other OEMs shipped it and generally got pretty good feedback. It also it, it got picked up in quite a few different places. Jolly Cloud based some of their initial work on it, um, and, uh, and a couple of distros used it as a, uh, as a sort of a, as a netbook interface. Um, for the next revision of the interface, we were, we were trying to sort of uh, let, make it relax a little bit. So you can see here, we took away the, the idea of sort of places on the, on the right and, and integrated all of that. We still kept the, the categories. Um, and, uh, and so we're still mapping from this underlying idea of you know, a categorized uh, uh, set of software on the, uh, on the desktop. Um, uh, this is what we did with, uh, with places, essentially. We made it its own sort of category in that list. Um, and then, based on all of this experience, we started the Unity design process. We, were, um, uh, we knew that we were going to do a bunch of work, more work with OEMs. Um, and they wanted, uh, and they wanted uh, uh, an interface that would um, be appropriate you know, for, for the projects that they had in mind. Um, we also knew that um, starting quickly, booting quickly, was a, was a, was a real priority. Um, and so we were willing to, we were willing to um, essentially replace big chunks of infrastructure with completely new code if we thought that we could, uh, we could, we could make things more lightweight. Um, and Unity uh, was in development for a, a, about eight months, and it first showed up in this, which is Ubuntu Lite. And so the requirements for Ubuntu Lite were to, to produce a really stripped-down system, uh, which would mainly be used for web browsing, 
Uh, it was designed for essentially a dual boot sort of environment with OEMs um, and, uh, and, and was really just designed to be running three or four applications, but which preserved enough of the core of the system that potentially over time it could be upgraded to a full desktop experience. So the idea with this um, is actually to, to install it on machines that are going out in the US and in Europe, uh, Windows on them. So this is a dual boot environment. And for us, that's a really cool idea to try and get to raise the amount of exposure that Linux gets. At the moment, you know, people, it's a choice. You have to either, you know, get a machine with Windows or get a machine with, uh, with, with Linux. We figured if we could get this to be successful and, and popular, you'd have a lot more people who are at least getting familiar with the interface, familiar with um, uh, the basic ideas, and could then easily upgrade to a full uh, system, sort of removing the Windows partition. This little icon of here actually is the, is the um, uh, uh, sort of dual boot control mechanism over there. And as you can see, um, we really sort of relaxed it completely. So that categorized uh, 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 application sort of structure is gone, and we just have a, um, a sort of a favorite applications. Um, and uh, so, so that was one chunk of work. Another chunk of work was up on the, on the top right there of what we call the, the, the indicators. Um, but there are all sorts of problems with this. Uh, uh, there's no mechanisms, for example, to sort of add and remove applications. There's no mechanisms there for dealing with sort of lots of files in a, in, in a, in a traditional way. And so um, at, uh, in the run-up to the last UDS, we uh, did a whole bunch of design work um, for, again, a sort of a full screen experience that we call the dash that would fit in um, over here. And so the dash is a, a um, just a full screen place for uh, uh, dealing with chunks, you know, lots of files or lots of applications. And we have ideas about what else might go in there as well, like contacts and things like that. Um, and so we mapped places up there uh, to the top into, into the sort of places bar and then created this space over here, which is the dash. And that's not been implemented. It, uh, it went into Maverick um, uh, a month or so ago, and it looks like this. Um, so now we have the launcher. We have uh, uh, the dash in the middle over here, places driving the dash essentially, and uh, and indicators up there, and that's that's uh, roughly what Unity is all about. Um, so in the design process, one of the really interesting things about it is um, uh, embracing constraints. You know, and the, it's very interesting. That's a very difficult thing for an open source community to do. Um, uh, one of the wonderful things about the open source community is that is that it grows um, as a function of the number of people joining it and their, and their, and their interests. So you know, someone will write a, a tool that works with MySQL as a database, someone else joins the community and they update it to, to work with Postgres as well, someone else joins the community and they figure out how to make, w make it work with no SQL databases and, and so it rolls, right? Um, and, but that's kind of in opposition to this idea that really great design comes from effectively reducing your options and reducing uh, and, and imposing constraints essentially on the process, so um, we, 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 we figure out how to balance that. We have lots of very vigorous conversations, but these are the sorts of constraints that we, that, that we apply to ourselves in the, in the design process. Um, uh, vertical pixels are the most precious kind of real estate um, on the screen, so there are many, many decisions and trade-offs that have been made in Unity with a very specific goal of maximizing the number of vertical pixels. Remember, um, netbooks are the, with, with the primary audience, and they've got screens which are typically wide but, but um, not very deep. Um, and uh, even if, even if when you're, you're on a larger screen, um, typically you're spending all day in the browser um, or all day in a particular application. You don't want a lot of Chrome cluttering up the screen. And we look, if you look at this, a, a typical desktop today, I don't know if you look at your desktops, um, uh, amongst people who haven't actually gone in and really configured the system, often there's just huge amounts of wasted space at the top and the bottom of the screen. So we put a lot of effort into basically figuring out how to put pieces together in, in you know, more and more efficient ways and, and the trade-offs associated with that. Um, for the netbook interface, um, we figured that we didn't want people to spend a lot of time doing window management. So the idea was to figure out how to make it sort of maximized all the time. Um, and so you see, again, a lot of assumptions about um, Windows, how window management would work. And then also just this idea that ultimately touch is going to be a primary method of interaction. So um, we didn't want to do stuff that ultimately was really dependent on, on having a, a, a pixel-perfect pointer um, because we just don't think that you'll have that on lots of the machines that people will want to use Unity. Um, in terms of sources of inspiration, the console really is um, a great source of inspiration for us. And, and that's true, I think, for a number of reasons. One, it, there's, there's an enormous amount of innovation that happens in the console space. Colin was talking earlier about how Linux 
uh, is you know so mission critical now that it's hard to re really radically innovate in that. And it's the same is true of the desktop. You know, uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, GNOME, um, KDE. It's really hard to motivate for radical innovation because you're going to break something from somewhere. But on in in, in the gaming space, um, there are no constraints. It's completely free form. It's not mission critical. So. In, in many senses, that's an environment that's been free to innovate and free to adopt ideas more quickly. So, uh, so I'm not saying we spend a lot of time playing games uh, during the Unity design process, but there's definitely a feel, if you use it, um, of, of kind of something that comes from a gaming environment. Um, light is a theme that we're using. So visually, you'll see a lot of the stuff is, 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 is designed and drawn with the idea of almost light coming through, light coming out of the screen, um, looking at, at, uh, at, 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 at the graphics. We use a lot of OpenGL. Um, in the in the implementation, and that's specifically so that we can get at the the, the, the more modern capabilities of um, graphics accelerated hardware, um, and so a, a lot of the effects and so on are actually implemented in GL directly, um, and that's only going to increase. And then the last sort of um, bit of inspiration we had was that we want people to be able to search for everything um, uh, rather than navigating to anything. So uh, in the dash in particular. Um, search is the primary means by which you would find something. So the idea is, if your search is really, really good, then in just a couple of keystrokes, you can present people with um, something that they can just touch. Uh, and so, so we're trying to get rid of the idea of navigating through um, hierarchies and just search and touch as the as the two sort of um, uh, ways to get get to stuff, get stuff activated, get out of stuff. Okay, so that's the background. What are all the different kinds of pieces of technology that come together in this? Um, well, one of the first things that we um, decided to embrace because of the focus on the netbook was the idea of a, of a panel-based menu. So uh, remember I said we, we're optimizing for maximized applications, uh, which means typically you're only working on one application at a time. Um, and so, so the, the potential disconnect that, 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 that some people experience when you use a panel-based menu on a large screen monitor with multiple windows, and the menu is sort of very disconnected from the window, those, uh, those effects are, are diminished in a, in a netbook-type environment. So we decided to adopt that. Um, uh, so we, 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 we uh, looked at the existing state. That there was an effort to do this in GNOME some time ago. Uh, in KDE, they used to have this capability in KDE 3, I think, but it, it hasn't been re-implemented in KDE 4. Um, and this has been a focus of work. Uh, a, a, a focus of work. We couldn't reuse the, the old GNOME one um, because just of the way it interacts with GTK, it was, it was a bit low level. Um, uh, and so what we did is we built a, a protocol over Dbus where you can export menus over Dbus. Um, and then we've got a plugin for a, a loadable module for GTK and the loadable module for Qt which in both cases allow the menu to be exported over Dbus. Um, so this is really great. Um, uh, that top menu over there is being rendered in, actually by Unity, um, and, uh, and the application just sends its menu to Unity over Dbus. Uh, we've got it working, r roughly working now for both Qt and, uh, and, and GTK apps, so, so they work well. Um, we don't have it working for uh, the Zool-based apps, so Firefox and, uh, and Thunderbird. And we also don't have it working for OpenOffice, but those will come. Um, essentially, it's just a question of implementing the hooks in the toolkit uh, to talk to Dbus, uh, and they're sort of client-side libraries that simplify all of that. Um, uh, that work was sort of promoted and published as a free desktop.org standard. Uh, a lot of, again, a lot of what we're trying to do, we're trying to sort of elevate the state of the art and then make sure that it works well across both GNOME and KDE, and so a lot of the appropriate forums for the conversations are sometimes like in free desktop.org. Um, thus, this is, a work, this is the focus of a lot of work right now in 1010 because um, uh, this is the sort of single biggest change that's happening in the next edition uh, for 1010. Um, and so the always amazing George, where's George, um, is leading the charge. Um, and um, I think there's a list of 80 or so applications that we need to um, sort of engage with. Uh, one of the assumptions, one of the things that, you know, if we're going to export stuff over, over Dbus, it means that you have to have a fairly standard um, a, a model of what a menu can look like. Um, and so there's been, you know, we, what we're doing is going through, going through all the applications and trying to find places where people have done stuff in, in sort of custom or unusual ways and then mapping that to a more standardized sort of model of a menu. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, it works over, over, over Dbus menu. Um, so that's that. So the, the, it was interesting. The global menu guys originally proposed to GNOME that GNOME adopt this approach, but it was, it was rejected. Um, it works very well on netbooks, um, and 
because of the way we've implemented now, you can actually just put an applet on, on a GNOME panel plugin and use it on the desktop as well. So I think most of the folks who are interested in the original global menu project are now using this. Okay. On the other side of the, uh, of the panel, we have the indicators. Um, so uh, this has traditionally been a, a real swamp in the GNOME world. Uh, it's a bit cleaner on the KDE world. But in the GNOME world, um, essentially, uh, the things that went up in the panel there um, could do anything. They were literally independent applications that were just um, visually displaying themselves in the panel, but there was no kind of cohesive view of all of them. Um, that meant that some, sometimes you had to right-click on the thing, sometimes you had to left-click on them, some, sometimes they responded to uh, mouse movements, because they could literally do anything. You know, I mean, every event was just being sent to, to, to some sort of application. Um, so we've replaced that now with this idea that everything in that top right um, has to have particular semantics. It, it, you know, it's basically a menu. That whole top right area now is one consistent menu. And so that has a whole bunch of uh, benefits. For example, accessibility. Uh, if you can get the focus to there, then you can navigate around because it's just one big menu, essentially. Um, you can even navigate between that and the application menu um, because it's really all just one big menu. Um, uh, uh, there's, there's a fairly standard set of patterns that, that you follow for the design of the icons, for example, in terms of the way you use colors. Um, and, uh, and a set of sort of user experience uh, patterns around that. Um, now that sort of looks fairly standard stuff. There are a couple of areas though where we've where we've um, um, innovated. One of the key goals, I did a very silly thing. I sort of mailed some one of the Ubuntu lists and said, "Hey, I need some screenshots of, of random desktops because I just want to get a feel for how you guys organize your desktops." And I think Foronix or someone else picked up on it, and I literally got like two thousand emails of of. Desktops. I got so sick and tired of right click save as, right click save as. And it was great though, because now, you know, you, it's really interesting. If you just flip through those fast, you start to sort of get a sense for common patterns in the way people have organized things. Anyway, um, uh, that top space up there is really precious, and there are a lot of things that, uh, there was a lot of clutter in that space. So we sort of said, how can we, from a design point of view, how can we really reduce the, the, the pressure on that space? Um, and, uh, and, and, and clean it up. And the sort of meme was to have fewer, classier indicators. Um, and so we came up with this, um, this idea of a category indicators. Uh, we noticed that um, uh, you know, there'd be uh, uh, an Amarok thing in there, and then be a, a Last FM thing in there as well. Um, because someone who likes music, so he's got Last FM and he's got Amarok. And they, they both each want some way to basically indicate status to the user um, and, and provide a quick shortcut way of, you know, pausing or starting or stopping the music. So we figured, well, you don't actually need to have, you don't need to have two of them there. You just need one that says, all my music stuff is here, and then they can sort of plug into that. Um, and since you've already got a, 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 an indicator up there that deals with noise, why not integrate it all into that? So the sound menu, for example, um, uh, the sound menu, the new design for the, uh, for, the, for the sound menu is that it's kind of pluggable. The application can go in here, rhythm box, can go in here, and you can have several sections of this. So uh, if, you're run, if you're running both, for whatever reason, if you're running Banshee and Rhythmbox, then they can both plug themselves in there. Um, and this is implemented now in Maverick, and, uh, and I, think it's, I think it's working quite well. Let's see. I'm muted, but you get the idea. So you have a, sort of a nice, convenient way of, uh, of sort of jumping through your music, pausing, playing, stopping. Um, and now there's a whole flurry. There's a bunch of, now that that API is public, um, there are a whole bunch of people essentially patching the, uh, the, the common music players so that they can fit into that. Um, really nice. There is a standard, a debug standard called MPRIS for a media player remote interface specification or something like that. And we've had to extend that a little bit, for example, to, uh, to make it possible for um, debus for, for the indicator to, uh, to know about your playlists, because that wasn't in M MPRIS before. But now you can go in, uh, I don't know that I've got any playlists set up here. Okay, so you can go and um, pick playlists and, uh, and just manage everything straight from the sound indicator. Um, similarly, for messaging applications, we saw that you have a bunch of people up there that have like an email thing, and then they'd have a Gmail notifier, and then they'd have a, um, uh, you know, something for IRC and something for you know, a bunch of others. So we put all of that down into the, into the messaging menu. Um, 
that's sort of up here. Uh, now I don't know if that's in. I don't know if any of this stuff is, uh, has landed in Debian yet. Um, but this is, uh, this is sort of an, an, a category indicator for all messaging applications. Um, and you can launch the applications from there as well. So from a user experience point of view, you don't have to tell someone, you know, go into the menu and start the application and then go over here and find your, find your email. Basically, you just always go to the messaging menu. You can, you can open up your mail application. You can see if it's running. Um, so this little indicator over here tells you, this little thing over here tells you that it's running. So, so by the end of 10.10, we should have the messaging menu, sound, session, clock, me menu, which is kind of a presence um, uh, 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 um, menu that you manage your, your presence on multiple different uh, um, network services. Um, uh, for the network menu, uh, we, we hope to, re to replace network manager with uh, uh, connection manager. Connection manager is the joint Intel Nokia effort. Um, and uh, 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 it's a very nice sort of back end. The, the, the separation between front end and back end is very clean. Um, it has various other things to recommend it. But there's no GNOME sort of interface for it that, uh, that, that, that we could use. So we're, we're building a new UI um, onto Conman on the back end. And that's, uh, that, that's, that's going steadily. Um, there's a library called libindicate that you can use to um, to put custom indicators into the panel, um, and uh, you know it's really straightforward to use because all you have to do is generate a menu. Remember, all of these things are just menus. So if you know how to create a GTK menu or a Qt menu, all you're doing is creating a menu and then saying to to the indicator framework, "Hey, will you you know here's the icon to use. Will you will you put up a menu um, or a, a, an indicator for this one?" Um, so the combination of libindicate and dbus menu uh, dbus menu works very well. Um, there are some specific APIs also for, the, for um, some of the category indicators, like the sound menu um, and the messaging menu, where, where you're specifically do describing what you want to do in there. I mean, because they, 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 they're different. Each of them is different. Um, and we also had to build a, a, a piece of technology um, to allow uh, um, menus to be specified in desktop files. Uh, and the reason for that is that we wanted to be able to expose some actions that the application could do if it was running when it wasn't running. Uh, when the application is running, of course, it can connect over Dbus and say, "Here is uh, here is uh, the you know here's the menu that I want you to to display." But we have to have some way of knowing um, what menu to describe when it's not running. So, for example, I think um, yeah, these these things over here, the menus are displayed even though the mail application isn't isn't running uh, at the moment. So the launcher. This is the this is the 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 big chunk of new work that landed in um, May. Uh, the launcher uses Clutter very heavily, so um, a lot of the animations and effects around it are Clutter based. Um, it uses d GL directly um, quite heavily, so a lot of the glow effects um, are, are rendered in GL. Try and offload as much of the uh, processing onto the, onto the GPU as possible, um, uh, and this has been really the, the focus of a lot of the user experience uh, design work. There's a hell of a lot that you have to that you have to encapsulate in that. You know, is something running? Um, is is something calling for attention? Is something? Um, uh, how many windows are there associated with a particular application? Um, which 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 window has the focus right now? There's a lot. There's a lot of sort of rich semantic um, uh, uh, content uh, that has to be distilled down. So it's been quite a a, a long um, uh, design process, but uh, it's come together very nicely, and I think. People will be happy with 10.10. A um, couple of new technologies had to be built for that. Uh, there's a, a framework called BAMF. I have no idea why it's called BAMF. Um, but essentially, it's uh, a new um, uh, uh, model for tracking applications in Windows. Um, this is like unbelievably um, uh, horrible under, under, under X as it is today. But just knowing what applications are displayed, what window actually has the focus, and so on, is, uh, is really quite tricky. Um, and so BAMF takes care of a lot of the details there. We reused, again, uh, dbus menu and the .desktop file menu definition structure that we had from, uh, from the indicators work. We reused that for, uh, for um, uh, quick lists. So you can go in, for example, and you know, you've got a capability like that. Um, and that comes from, that's, again, using the same uh, uh, technologies and because the, the menus can be specified in desktop files they uh, they um, uh, can be present even if the application isn't running 
Um, it is it's implemented at the moment as a Mutter plugin. Uh, so Mutter is Metacity plus Clutter. Um, so you've got kind of Clutter on top of Clutter, um, all in, in a spectacular attempt to make an uncluttered interface um, with lots of, lots of sort of trying to pass through Clutter um, to get to the, to the underlying GL. And then this last piece, the dash and, uh, and uh, what we call places, um, uh, this is again implemented in Clutter. Uh, the architecture here is you have a complete separation between the thing that's doing the rendering the interface and the um, uh, um, daemons that are essentially pr you know, producing data to be rendered. Um, they talk to each other over Dbus, um, and it's, it's uh, designed so that you can have multiple things going on at the same time because you may well want to you know, issue a query, a search query, for example, over lots of places. So you might say, you know, show me, uh, you know, find files like this, and that might um, shoot off to Google and do one query and um, r kick some processes off looking at what's on your hard disk and, and you know, send um, some, some other thread spinning off to Amazon and you want to integrate all of that. So it's designed to, uh, to have lots of things going on uh, and, and synthesized and rendered by something that, 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 that won't easily get distracted from the rendering. Um, there's a library there called libd. Libd can, can, you know, basically defines the data model of what can be rendered over there. Um, and then libunity is kind of a command set up and take down um, library. So if you want to if you want to put your own if you want to put your own content into into the, the dash like this, then you create your own daemon that, that talks to it. It uses libunity to sort of register itself, and then it uses libd to uh, um, publish the data that it uh, that it wants rendered. Um, you can also plug into the dash itself um, custom renderers, uh, so they will take the data from um, uh, uh, off Dbus and then render it in, in an appropriate way. So using Dbus for everything allows us to do stuff in a way that's really quite nice from a cross-desktop um, uh, perspective. Um, so you could, for example, write a cute implementation of exactly the same thing and use all the same um, places daemons, um, just rendering uh, in Qt. And, uh, um, uh, or if, if you didn't want to use Clutter, for example, because you didn't have the graphical horsepower, then you could just do it in GTK as well. So separating out the, 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 the representation, the display, the rendering from the actual data model is, has proved quite useful um, to us already in that regard. Um, and that's it. So Ayatana is the name that we gave the sort of overall design initiative. We called it that because it's the, it's the word that sort of Zen Buddhists use for um, awareness. Uh, so the, the, the thinking is that you know we've 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 lots of great applications, and the application when you're working on an application, um, that application defines you know what you what you're concentrated on. But then there's all this other stuff going on around that, um, things like notifications, things like you know your your your, your system status, whether you're connected, what, what's happening with your battery, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of in your peripheral awareness. Um, and so uh, so that's where the term Ayatana comes from. It's all open source, all hosted on Launchpad.net, and uh, and should ship. For 1010 Netbook Edition. Are there any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Not yet, no. Hi, Henry. I do a Linux distribution for Converger. Um, should try it out. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, I believe that uh, Ubuntu is the base for Google Chrome. And I couldn't help but think to myself at the time that surely Google Chrome is in aiming for networks and doing very similar things. So I was just wondering, are you working together? Are you looking at what they're doing? Mm. Are you... So the Chrome OS team did start with a as a sort of development environment, but they've moved. They've moved on from there. Um, I think for Chrome OS, their, their desire was to sort of build more in the same sort of way where you build an, an embedded device. So they've actually switched to Portage, Gen two Portage, as a build as a build system. Oh, you really like that, right? So there's a so this, at this stage, I'm no expert at all on the sort of architecture or approach that they've taken, and there isn't there hasn't been much cross pollination from a user experience point of view either. For, for quite a long time, I don't know how it's coming along. Well, they'll get there. 
Yeah. Um, you said earlier uh, on that you were um, looking at search and touch as the primary um, interface. Into mm -hmm. so, um, you said that you are looking at search and touch as the primary interface um, in Unity. And I'm, I'm curious how you, um, especially when we're talking about a touch-based device that has no keyboard, um, how you are going to think of balancing that out in particular. Um, how does the search part work if all you're doing is touching? Um, so if any substantial touch device is going to have an on-screen keyboard, but you don't want, I think the real key there is that you don't want to have to type a lot, right? So it's um, about two things. First, it's about um, the way that search is presented in the interface, like how hard is it to, is to get to where you can start searching. And then also it's about the quality of your search. You know, if I can just type three letters on a on a tablet touch screen, it's, it's an unsatisfying way to type, right? Finger, finger, finger. But if I don't have to do a lot of it, then uh, then um, that's probably acceptable. Um, but are you are you exploring any ways to perhaps be able to start a search in a way without using keyboard at all? It's, um, sounds well it's an oxymoron in a way, I suppose. To to a certain extent, yes. Because if you look at um, Um, you kind of tell us where you want to be searching, um, and so we can we could potentially bring stuff into hot cache. Uh, so this is a view of the applications. Um, so this, this is what this is what this is essentially all those menus uh, in, in, in in the current shell. Um, and uh, so if you're searching here, we know you're searching for applications, and we can search first across the things. Install that's fast, and then slightly more slowly we can search, you know, things that aren't yet installed, and then even more slowly we can go search the web for stuff that you know don't yet know about, but that might match. Um, uh, I can't think of any other cunning ways we could start to search before you've typed anything. But the telepathy module isn't implemented yet. <laughs> yeah. So just back there. Hi. Um I'm glad to hear that you're working on search a lot more as an interface, and I think we just put that time. Uh, yeah, folks. Uh, and I think it's really useful. One thing that I find a little scary is when you say that it's like getting rid of hierarchies. So hierarchies as the primary interface, I think, yeah, are pretty flawed. But certain people, I mean, we we have, humans have this remarkable ability to like keep a map of physical space in our brains, as some people and others like. You see people who have incredibly messy offices and can find stuff. And I, I think that in a way, hierarchies kind of represent that. So, like, I think it's good to focus, put maybe more of the focus on mm -hmm. um, search, but I mean, if it, you can't replace everything. That's interesting. So, so I think I agree with you where you've got natural categories, natural categorization, especially where you've got categorization um, that's common across lots of different people's machines. So a little bit of that, you know, the internet category, uh, the office category of software, and letting people sort of, inviting people to kind of come in and have a look uh, and see what's there. Um, sometimes when you make search the only way to find something, people, people don't know how imaginative they can be, you know what I mean? Search for teleportation machine, you wouldn't because you couldn't possibly believe that, you know, anybody could have one. Um, what, what is interesting, though, is how something that's perfectly natural for most of us, which is directories, full files, and other directories, is astonishingly difficult, or just astonishingly uh, broken for typical end users. So I saw that first. I actually sat and watched people using the system, and often you'd see things like, for example, people would receive a file um, by email, and they would save it, and then they would want to either email that file to someone else or open it in some other application, and they couldn't find it. Um, they'd, they'd been presented with all of the information they needed to, to complete that task, but it just didn't stick in some way. So I just noticed it you know, on uh, user, t you know, as we were watching user testing of folks off the street, and you know, sort of intellectual arrogance that immediately kicks in where you say, well, you know, ah, oh, you know. Ordinary users don't understand this stuff, but I'm fine. Right? And then I 
started to observe just my own use of it, and I spent a lot of time trawling through, especially where I've got discs of lots of stuff that I know, like photograph collections and things like that. It's on the disc. I know it's on the disc, but I can't exactly remember whether it was, you know, how I'd organized it at that particular time. Especially over the years, over, you know, we've got data that you've built up over the years. I don't know if you have a similar experience. Um, so I'm getting older, getting dumber, um, so I need to try and get the software usable by the time I hit my 70s so that I <laughs> have a personal mission. Um, so I'm really coming around to the view that actually, um, even, for, even for the very smartest users, uh, uh, that may be a waste of their smarts. You know, like if we can just get it so that you can start typing and get what you want, that's much better. Um, I think there are a lot of gaps that we have to close in that. But that's kind of where I think we have to get to. Um, uh, and I think the web has taught us that it's, it's possible to do an amazingly job, a good job with, uh, with search. Let's just sort of see if we can come back to that. Um, I don't know that I'm yet ready to say, make the file system opaque, you know. But there are many cases where, for example, uh, you, you really shouldn't hit the file system. For that case of someone who got emailed a document, saved it, and then tried to open a document in something else, the way this, where the file place is able to work, for example, you know, see the stuff that I have been working on, you know, most, most recently, immediately, and then I can search on top of that, you know, very, very, very efficiently. Um, at least that's the design thinking. I mean, the nice thing about having, we, we've got this real flourishing at the moment. The Migo guys are doing really interesting work. I don't know if anybody's looked at it. It's radically different. It's really cool. It's innovative. Um, there's Android out there, um, Unity, I think, is pioneering certain things. There's the GNOME shell, um, if you've looked at their design, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's also quite different. So KDE4, so this is actually a very interesting time for uh, innovation and creativity, and I'm pretty sure that, that, that we'll all emerge from it in two or three years' time, very happy. Um, I was just, I mean, sorry, as you were mentioning about search and about finding things, I was thinking uh, something that would be about it's being developed against the Zeitgeist. Yeah, so the Zeitgeist powers this. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, um, again, the Zeitgeist guys, you know, they, they started out on the it really coming from the Ubuntu community. Philosophy is uh, is kind of the, the champion on that, and uh, we embraced, I'm right, George. We embraced Zeitgeist yeah. pretty much immediately. We've used it, and you know, they've been debating its adoption in GNOME. I don't know what the basis on that is. Not, not yet, not yet. So again, that's sort of useful. We have embraced that guys. It means that we'll kick the guys up. if it if it works well. Then we'll prove that you know might be more likely to use it. Maybe KDE would be more likely to use it. And conceptually, it's really interesting. Zeitgeist is a way of organizing metadata about how you're using stuff and when you're using it and where you're using it. So potentially, for example, you can walk into a room and say, and when you when you hit that button, that top button over there, you see the files that. Uh, you last looked at when you were in that room, um, or in uh, Central Park, or in the coffee shop. So it's just a really interesting uh, project to sort of think, rethink the metadata that we track about what files we're using to data, for example. When I was reading this email, I was surfing that web, you know, so that kind of correlation. Uh, so yeah, Zeitgeist is absolutely uh, embedded in that. So have you thought all about how you search mode into the hierarchical mode, or at least I can eventually ls our entire tree and find it that way. Yeah, this is the of this tree. So the the, the, the um, semantic structure of what you see on the screen is that you've got the place entries, which are those sort of chunks at the top. We're actually going to move those things down you know, on my screen. We've actually moved the places down into the, into the launcher itself um, as an experiment to see how that works for us. Um, but so you can have multiple place entries, it's the sort of top of your structure, and then inside of that you have um, uh, sections. So uh, you can't see it on here, but you would see it on um, uh, let's see it up there. So there are sections over there, and then you actually have groups as well. Um, 
Um, uh, so that's the kind of hierarchical structure. And you can nest quite easily into that. Um, and then the semantics as to how you search so that you can just search just inside a thing or you search everything. Um, uh, it's not, we're not trying to build a file browser, you know, we're not trying to build a better audience. Um, so I think we'd, we'd probably set limits on how much we would try to support that kind of, you know, click through trawling. Um, I'd much rather invest that energy into getting the search right. Mark, I'm going to give you your, uh, oh no, it's Kurt moment. Um, first, you mentioned about getting things right before you're seven. Christine and I would like you to come and meet our two new children, Tara and Harvest. <laughs> so we've got genetically ready organs for us. Um, my question sort of relates to all of this. Do you think you run the risk of, by simplifying this interface to such an extent, that you start giving users the impression that their new Ubuntu or their new Linux or their new whatever this is on their computer that they haven't seen before, this is a simple operating system. And when you want to get real work done, that's when you reach for the Vista or Windows 7 CD or OS 10 CD. And that what this is mostly meant for is it's a utility operating system. It doesn't really do that much. Do you see any sort of potential problem there? And if so, how do you plan to address it? Uh, look, I think, I think uh, it's really hard to argue against simplicity. Even people who have really complicated, important, heavy duty things to, to, to get done don't really want the rest of the operating system crowding in on them while they're trying to get that done. Um, I had a really interesting experience. My, my folks have always had, um, my dad, for example, has always had a, an Ubuntu PC. Um, well, for the last six years, he's had an Ubuntu PC and, uh, and a Windows laptop. Um, and uh, uh, he, he needed, uh, the, the Windows laptop was sort of dying. So I got him a new one and I, I didn't even think about it. I just, you know, with, uh, with, with Windows on it. And uh, anyway, two or three days after, after we set it up, he came over and he said, listen, do you mind, do you mind installing Ubuntu on that new laptop? Um, because it's much easier to use. Um, and I think a lot of easy to use is a question of familiarity and so on and so forth on, on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think we really get to the point where um, the new interfaces for Linux are genuinely easier to use than the stuff that's been built up and built up and built up in the Windows environment where they can't afford to change too much. Um, and where there are sort of, so other pressures on, on like, the, you know, the, the pressures on OEMs to install more software before they ship it, which inevitably makes it more crowded and slower. So, yeah, there is a chance that if we put kind of crisp, clean, clear things on there, people think think of them as devices and therefore not as sort of proper or, you know, general purpose computers. But I, I suspect the flip side is more likely that people want to spend more of their time using this device just because, you know, whenever they want to get something done, they can quickly get it done. At least that's, that's the goal. Um, and it, if I could just add, I mean, if you're talking about the, the notion of a, you know, a simple interface and people say, oh, that you can only use simple things. I, mean, I remember when OS X came out, that was exactly the, res the reaction that a lot of people had to the look at the screen. So it's got this five things sitting at the bottom, and it t t hasn't seemed to have uh, gotten in the way of people also. They can also use it for serious work as well. Yes, but that was very, very adept at manufacturing desire and heat and in our community as well. Well, that's so. What I'd say is that Apple is good at making something that people lust after that they want to use. Wouldn't it be nice if they felt that way about Debbie? Yeah. And that's what this project is all about, right? Because if we get this right and Debbie ships it, then I think people will feel this way and will feel like, wow, this is fantastic. Um, I I think we're in a position to, to be better than Apple. That's the goal we set two years ago. I think we've got another two years till 1204, uh, squeeze plus one, Thanks. and, uh, and uh, let's get it done. Yeah. Um, so I really like it that you're improving search, but I find that when I search for files, there's two modalities. If I know something about the file, then it might be worth uh, searching for it. But often you don't, you're just fishing for something. And then, it's like someone was saying there, um, 
there's a territory in there and it's gonna be in there no matter what you do because for the inside stuff it's still gonna be there right so I thought it was a bit weird you said I'm not yet thinking about making it opaque but why would you ever because it seems to me that they're orthogonal right I mean make search as good as you can maybe somebody else uh, wants to uh, to make the, the hierarchy basically browse well, I think yeah. our browsers there's, there's, there's room, I think, for um, for alternative sort of storage models. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever worked at one of those sort of big firms where they have these, effectively they've replaced the, the file save as dialogue, like in lawyers, for example, with something that basically maps to this huge document management system that they've got where you can, you know, they, they track every file, like I said, which client, which case, which, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously in a file of a firm of 500 lawyers, all of whom could be working on different cases for different clients and so on, but over a 20 year period, you, you don't just want arbitrary people making up a file hierarchy. So they've built these systems that are sort of really custom purpose built storage systems just for them. Um, uh, what's interesting is that, you know, the, 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 the world you've got hierarchical files and folders all those custom things. And I think what we're going to move to is more like you've got search as the standard, and then if you want, you could potentially have uh, hierarchical files and files interface where you set it up and you craft it that way. And you still also have those sort of more industry specific, vertical market specific storage or document management systems as well. So, yes, I, I guess I'm agreeing with you. I think there will always be room for someone who wants to create files and folders and do it that way. But, but I think we can improve the experience dramatically for the average user. Who, you know, in, in, a, in a week, we may actually process no more than a couple of hundred files. It's not that much. And uh, so it's easily within what we can handle from a search perspective. And we can, we can, you know, we can, we can take away all the burden for you of having to track that. You know, where did that go? What happened to the file? What did I do? I got this over IRC, uh, you know. With Zytex, we could track, for example, yes, you got that in a file from this person. So you can start searching from the name of the person and see the file that they sent you, that sort of thing. It's just much richer. Let the computer do the work. Martin. The way I tend to uh, work with files is either in two ways. Either I have a specific file, like a photograph, that's its own item, its own identity. And I have these literally full folders with all the files. And the way, of course, the way we have a file system means that all of the things are organized in the same way. And the classification for this one photograph is in a folder because I classify it in certain ways. Or this folder that actually contains a project full of files uh, is a full folder because it's because of the technology that we, we, we're using. Um, but actually, when I think about it, the project is one thing, even though it's a full, full folder. And, and Mac does, do, does this with their uh, applications and their other DNGs and other various properties where they have uh, archives as these items and then you can search for the archives and that makes more sense. Whereas um, when you go into those objects and you have folders, Debian folder and your pro pro project folder, um, that's when you need the, the navigation, the hierarchies and the various other things because you do have a collection and you are thinking about the whole thing as, a, as, a, as an item. Whereas when you're think thinking about your photographs, it's only when you start to think about galleries and maybe printing all of them out in a, as a, a collection that that kind of, you know, you need to have a more structured view. Right. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are about uh, collections and whether we should be searching for collections. I think collections are actually tricky because often we don't ingest enough metadata in them to, for search to, to necessarily be easy. You know, if you went, went, went on the holiday and you took 50 pictures, you may well not write enough about them in metadata and so on to be able to separate between them. You can actually get to the collection, you know, holiday in Spain, oof, uh, but you might so easily get to one of the 2,000 pictures that you have in mind. Um, I guess the, the online services have a lot, you know, have a huge advantage because they, they start to have enough data and enough compute power. They can, you know, look at the, look at the photographs and do face recognition. So you can, you can say, show me photos of Jenny and outcome photos of Jenny without you having had to, to, to mark them up. Uh, I don't have any brilliant ideas on that, but I 
can believe this sort of idea that um, in some settings you, you want to work with collections and that this model isn't going to work very well for that. I, I can certainly believe that. Just Scott? Just to say on that one, just to go out there, I'd like to So I was just uh, following up on what you just said. You've got basic metadata in the You've got the, when the photo was taken, where the photo was taken. You've got where, who's in the photo, how many people in the photo. There's a whole bunch of metadata here the user doesn't have to put in. Right, that you can do through either inspecting the, the, the thing or, or exit, yeah. We've got, what, two, three minutes left? I became a Debian user when I uh, updated app to, uh, to Debian. So, um, but, but, and, and I know, like, to, usually a lot of Debian users, they think of Ubuntu as this whole sister project that just took, a, took away some of the publicity. But actually to me, because I came through Ubuntu, it means a lot, like a path that Ubuntu um, was a huge public and then it brought me to the world of Debian. Now, uh, when Canonical says that they're going to, uh, you, you spoke earlier and you said that a Canonical would you know, partner with OEMs to provide this as like a second OS or you know, for netbooks, and I was just wondering if you could you know, elaborate on that and just explain what kind of plans you have, and I assume, of course, Canonical is a for profit company, so they have some business plan, which, you know, is perfectly, you know, uh, is of course part of the, you know, whole thing. So I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of ideas are the future? Well, first, thank, 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 thank you for sharing the story of, you know, meeting Ubuntu and then going on to, to, to Debian. I think that's quite a common pattern now. This is, you know, quite a fun con for me because, A, I've been doing it six years now and, uh, and, and so know lots of great people, but also because it's much harder to build lines of affiliation, you know what I mean? Because there are a lot of people who spend time with Ubuntu, spend time with Debian, upload packages to both places, etc., etc. So your story, I think, is is a common one and uh, and uh, uh, makes everybody's life easier. So add your name to one of the lists of contributions to Debian, I'd be, I'd be appreciative. Um, uh, we're now shipping millions of PCs around the world every year with Ubuntu pre-installed. Debian derivative pre-installed. Um, I think I see no reason why that number won't grow by uh, an order of magnitude. Um, just if I look at the dynamics there, uh, we've got Windows XP expiring. Um, there's huge and growing demand for computing in parts of the world that have never had it, so therefore that aren't quite as prejudiced against, uh, so so heavily so attached to Windows as uh, as uh, as folks would be. Um, and also, what people want to get done with computers is changing. Uh, you know, it's amazing. It's been a very long time since anybody said to me, "But I can't run an office on it." You know what I mean? It's just it's much less issue now, um, and and the diminishing issue. But we've got the web to thank for that. So, so while I can't go into the specific plans I might have with a particular vendor, um, uh, last year or the year before, Microsoft came out and said, you know that. Linux on a netbook was dead. Uh, that was, I think, a slightly premature declaration of uh, uh, victory on their behalf. Um, so, so the, you know, we continue to, 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 to want to take free software to the whole world. And this year will be a good one for that. And one last question, I got. Okay, a uh, very specific question about the messaging indicator. I've been using it on one, one of my computers. Uh, it collapses email, uh, Twitter, and chat. Uh, three completely different things that have different uh, time you want to respond to. Uh, maybe very quickly, uh, is there any uh, thing about splitting them up, or is there a very specific reason why they are together? Yeah, there's a there's a there is a sort of nagging inconsistency in the relationship between them. Presence menu. Uh, presence menu is say, for example, I'm on, I'm on, I want to be signed into this um, IRC channel and I want to be online or change my status and so on. And the messaging menu is where you deal with sort of responses coming through that. And so it may be that, that in future we, we map the kind of instant messaging, real time sort of stuff over to, uh, to, to the presence menu. We haven't figured that out. It's kind of an open question, we debate it. Um, there just isn't, hasn't been, nobody's put forward anything that we can all look at and go, oh, that's exactly right. Um, I think the critical thing uh, with the messaging menu is um, the way the application decides
provides to use it's the facilities there the, the, the facilities that the messaging menu exposes um, are, are, uh, there's a section per application and they can put I think up to seven entries in that um, so the, the initial you know if you for example if your mail application put the names of the last seven people who sent your email it wouldn't be that useful um, the mail you probably want more to get a sense of of how much mail there is, you know, 20 unread messages or something like that. Um, however, if your mail application had the ability for you to sort of tag some people in your address book and say, I want to know when this person sends me an email, that would be useful. So you could go and have a look and you see immediately, oh, I've got mail from Matt or I've got mail from Jane. That would be useful and you can go straight to that message, you know, if you have a sort of an important message. And then the other facility, which is a shared facility, um, is that you can, um, not online now, but if I, if, I, if I went online, for example, um, uh, uh, and someone pinged me, and, and I you know, wasn't, wasn't looking at the, at the chat window, then that would go to me. And so there's a way of basically saying, there is a message in here that needs your attention. And again, it's a question of how sophisticated the app is in, in how it uses that facility. Um, if, the, if the app just goes green all the time, then you're kind of smearing the facility. Anyway, we're out of time. Thank you very much, and uh, nice to be here.